Hi, I'm Mike Malek. I work at Oracle over in Colorado, uh, actually, on a couple of uh, cloud products that use Spark on the back end. Um, don't buy any Oracle stock based on what I'm going to present here. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk about sentiment analysis using a combination of uh, three technologies, WordDevec, convolutional neural networks, and co-occurrence graph. Now, some of these three technologies are, are neural network based and some are symbolic based. And so the com because of that combination, it puts it under the broad umbrella of neurosymbolic computing. So before I talk about the specific technique uh, for sentiment analysis, I'm going to give some background on what neurosymbolic computing is. And to do that, I'm going to talk about how it relates to AI in general. So in AI, there's weak AI and strong AI, but I think weak AI is kind of a pejorative. It's really classic AI. And to know what classic AI, AI is, we can just turn to uh, the table of, of contents from Norvig. Um, and all these are just the classic AI techniques. I want to point your attention to part five, learning, which is really just the machine learning part of it. All the rest of AI is basically uh, symbolic related. And one of the uh, recurring themes I want to drive home during this presentation is there was kind of a symbolic winter from about 2010, the advent of big data, up until about last year. Strong AI is the stuff of science fiction, but over the last few years, we've gotten uh, use of some new acronyms, AGI and ASI for human and superhuman level intelligence. And because we have those acronyms now at our disposal, um, we've seen the use of the term AI come back into fashion again over the last year. Uh, it's safe to use it now because it means we are not talking about AGI and ASI. And of course, the overall reluctance of using the term AI in the past is because of all these AI winters uh, lasting so frequently and so long that it created a kind of permafrost that when 2010 came along and big data came uh, into the prominence uh, and we wanted to process that big data, we, start, we turned to terms like uh, data mining and machine learning instead of AI. But over the last um, uh, 12 to 18 months, we've seen Silicon Valley companies actually use the term AI again. Um, okay, so what is neurosymbolic computing? First, the term itself, is it neurosymbolic or neural symbolic? I did a quick chart based on searching uh, Google Scholar. It's approximate. I also uh, ignored the term NSI since it was so, so infrequent. The two terms were neck and neck until about 2003, and then neural symbolic pulled ahead. I still prefer the term neurosymbolic for some reason. Um, and then you see that big di dip in around 2013, and that's the symbolic winter uh, when big data came around. And by extension, there was also a neurosymbolic uh, winter as well. So uh, to, to give a sort of a flavor of this, what, what, what we mean by neurosymbolic, I'm going to quickly zip through about 20 disparate different examples. Um, the first one is WordDevec, so this one is actually relevant uh, to, to our particular technique. So WordDevec assigns uh, a numeric vector to every possible word in a dictionary, uh, and it does that by training up a neural network. Uh, you feed a huge corpus through it. Uh, the most famous uh, model out there is the Google News model based on a huge corpus of Google News articles. Uh, and you train this neural network to predict the next word uh, in your news story. So um, uh, if you have a sentence, uh, philosophers are Aristotle and Socrates, uh, when you plug in a one-hot encoded vector of Aristotle on the input side, you expect to see uh, a one-hot encoded Socrates on the output side. And uh, you do that. Uh, for the whole uh, dictionary, the Google News model has a dictionary of 3 million words, so V is equal to 3 million on the input and output. And the hidden layer uh, in the Google News model is 300, because uh, we want to end up with vectors of 300 each. And um, what we end up with uh, on that hidden layer is a, a weight matrix that has 3 million rows, each of uh, 300 uh, components in its vectors, and those become the word vectors. So we don't actually use this neural network to do actual prediction. We're just stealing the weights out of it, and those become our word vectors. And once you have vectors associated with each word, then that opens up the whole world of various machine learning techniques uh, to apply to natural language processing. Uh, some of the people who are trying to research towards uh, human level intelligence turn to uh, neurosymbolic computing. One of the more ambitious ones is OpenCog. Um, so Gertrude's uh, system diagram here, some of those boxes are 
uh, neural network based and some are, are symbolic based. A little less ambitious is plugging in a symbolic uh, processing unit inside the reinforcement learning. And uh, along the same lines, uh, in the field of lifelong machine learning, uh, the goal there is to avoid the typical cycle of uh, train a model, throw it away, train a model, throw it away, and instead accumulate knowledge over a period of months and years. And so the symbolic system accumulates the knowledge while the neural network does the inference to supply the newfound knowledge. You may have seen this news a couple of months ago coming out of DeepMind where they're using a genetic algorithm to figure out how to hook up uh, a neural network together. Now, you know, genetic algorithms come from the realm of classic AI, symbolic AI. And a couple of years ago, uh, their name was MUD. Uh, the common thinking was that genetic algorithms were uh, too slow to converge because they're based on randomness, whereas uh, neural networks converge quickly uh, because they're based on gradient descent. Um, but that's really only true uh, if you have a gradient uh, to descend. Um, if your error surface is bumpy, uh, full of mountains, full of holes, uh, you need the, the uh, randomness of a genetic algorithm. And speaking of genetic algorithms, uh, there's a Python library that will use a GA uh, to optimize your hyperparameters. Uh, some people out there try to map uh, knowledge graphs directly onto the topology of a neural network and vice versa, extracting symbols out of a neural network. Uh, this is similar to what I presented at Spark Summit last year, where you use a neural network to predict missing edges out of a knowledge graph. Uh, 1960s AI was all about search, breadth first search, depth first search, A star search. Well, a neural network can guide that search, prune the search tree. It has many applications. This is a really cool technology. Um, so this is similar to WordDevec, uh, where we assign a vector to edges of a knowledge graph. So that published song is an edge out of a knowledge graph and uh, Michael Jackson and Beat It are um, two vertices. And this, uh, this machine learning training uh, ensures that those vectors uh, sum up properly. And of course, once you have a knowledge graph in the form of vectors, then that, again, that opens up all the techniques of machine learning that we're familiar with. Okay, various pipelines of uh, neural and symbolic. Uh, sequence with sequence has been getting a lot of press lately. Uh, so this is story summarization using an RNN and you snoop and steal the probabilities and figure out which are the most popular words that you should be stealing for your summarization. And there are other applications as well. Uh, sequence to class, actually what, we're, what I'm presenting, going, going to be explaining uh, shortly uh, is uh, an example of that, the sentiment analysis. So. I'm just leaving that as a bullet point here. I'm gonna, gonna get back to that in just a moment. Another application is uh, parsing. This is an example of taking a natural language query and mapping it onto a, a knowledge graph edges. Uh, and this example of genomics, you take a PPI graph, uh, convert it into vectors using that knowledge graph embedding I showed just a couple of slides ago and pump it into a convolutional neural network. Uh, probably the first thing that should have come to your mind when you heard the term neural symbolic is self-driving cars, because obviously they take in a, an array of sensor input into deep learning uh, and uh, process the resultant symbols using rules and graphs for the maps, for example. And really it's just a special case of other computer vision applications. And finally, a uh, final example of neural symbolic computing is trying to understand the guts, the uh, internals of the black box of a neural network. And so some researchers out there realize that a neural network is a bunch of additions and multiplications, and those can be translated into ors and ands, Boolean expressions, which can be simplified and you can get out your salient uh, features. Uh, some uh, techniques of transfer learning uh, also use uh, symbolic understanding. Okay, what neural symbolic computing is not, just because you see symbols in the pipeline doesn't necessarily mean it's neural symbolic because any machine learning pipeline is going to have symbols on the inputs and the outputs. And then LSTM and NTM, they have memory, but they don't memorize symbols, they memorize uh, neural network weights, so they don't count either. All right, now we're gonna finally talk about uh, the technique for sentiment analysis. Uh, so background on sentiment analysis, 
uh, prior techniques, the basic technique for sentiment analysis is bag of words. You create vectors based on how many times that word appeared in your sentence and just run that vector through logistic regression. Uh, much more powerful and very popular technique these days and actually the foundation for what I'm gonna be presenting um, is a combination of convolutional neural networks and words of X. So here you take your sentence, stack it up vertically, and then you lay each word to vec vector uh, horizontally and, cr and, and create this matrix. Uh, and then you run that through a convolutional neural network and then on the output side, you end up with a one hot encoding of two values, positive sentiment or negative sentiment. And this is kind of interesting because um, this is actually just a one dimensional convolutional neural network, which is different than um, where, where it came from. Uh, most CNNs are used for image analysis. You take a 2D array of pixels and uh, at the very top, then you have your final output. Is this a dog or is it a cat? All right, so um, now I'm gonna finally talk about CNN, word to vec and co-occurrence graphs. So here's the motivating idea here, um, that uh, bigrams carry context. So the words in the word to vec have no concept of the context around them. So work and peace are generally uh, good words to see, but piece of work is a bad thing to see. So the idea that we're gonna be doing is we're gonna try and capture all the popular bigrams and then add those as features to our model. So how do we find bigrams? Well, we can use a co-occurrence graph. So we create this graph by um, adding an edge wherever between two words, if those two words are uh, found in close proximity to each other. And if there's already an edge there, then we increment the edge count by one. And, and, and so then we find out the uh, highest weighted edges because those are the most popular bigrams. And we take, in my case, I take the 300 most popular bigrams and create 300 more features out of that. So the left half of this table is the um, base CNN word to vec technique. And then the entire table is my technique. So basically I'm adding 300 new features to create a total of 600 features. And in the 300 new features, everything's zero, except I put a one where I see an occurrence of a bigram. And so each of those 300 columns corresponds to uh, the 300 bigrams that I detected as being popular. So how to uh, implement this? Well, I like to prototype things using uh, Jupyter and Keras and then actually implement it in, in Spark and Scala. So uh, Jupyter's really powerful uh, and uh, Keras is uh, just as powerful and it uses, Keras uses TensorFlow on the back end. In fact, some say that Keras is too powerful. Uh, a lot of machine learning uh, experts complain that it it's too, makes it too easy for beginners because uh, it hides so much of the, you know, the muck that you have to deal with. Um, and so, you know, it's very fast to prototype. Well, once you've prototyped something in Keras, how do you get into the Spark? Well, there's a library called Deep Learning 4J that supports Spark. And it actually has something called Keras model import, but it can only import an already trained model. So you would have to have like a computer, single computer big enough to train your model if you wanted to use that. Um, otherwise you're, uh, you're left to like I did, uh, manually uh, converting the model over uh, from Keras to Deep Learning for J and I'll show that. Okay, so for um, these technologies and technology choices, there's really only one choice for word to vec under Python and that's GenSim. It's actually the best word to vec implementation in any language, so that was an obvious choice. Uh, so the technology choice for word to vec under Spark, um, so there are a couple. Obviously there's MLlib, but that uh, is still unable to read the famous Google News model, the pre pre-trained model that you can download. There's a Jira ticket out for that and a PR associated with that Jira ticket, but I merged in that PR and it still wasn't able to read it satisfactorily. So I turned to Deep Learning 4J and that actually has a word to vec module that can read uh, the Google News model. Um, it took a little getting to get it to work with CNNs though because the def by default, uh, DL4J will normalize every vector in the, in the, in the model 
And th that just messes up all the relative weights from one word to the other, and by extension messes up CNN. So I, uh, I had to turn to this deprecated method that had this warning, do not use, and well, that's, that's what gets it to work. Uh, load Google model non-normalized. Uh, oh, and I wanted to point out that neither of these uh, distributes the model. The, the data structure for both MLIB and DL4J is literally array vector, um, which uh, might be a problem. Uh, the Google News model is 1.5 gigs. Some of these got model, word to vect models can get up to four gigs, but maybe that's okay in today's machines. Maybe it's okay to distribute two gigs to all your Spark nodes broadcast. Okay, for convolutional neural networks, I already said I used Keras under Python. Uh, under Spark, um, there are a couple of choices. I was originally intending to use MCNN uh, out of Spark packages. It had a promising version number of 0 0.5, but it was woefully incomplete. It didn't even have pooling layers, um, and it seems to have been abandoned. So I turned to uh, Deep Learning 4J. It supports Spark explicitly. It also supports GPUs, although I didn't use that. Um, but it does uh, require a lot of manual tweaking compared to Keras. Uh, you have to do a lot of stuff on your own with Deep Learning 4J, your own train test splitting, your own batching even, uh, setting up the RDDs in a batched format. Um, and it also uh, makes you use ND4J, which is like um, Pandas and MATLAB matrix style indexing for Java, if you can believe it. Um, and then of course, uh, as I said, you have to translate all your layer names. So uh, obviously, you know, different APIs have different names for their layers. And this is just the layers. Um, there's also, um, you know, the activations, the optimization algorithm names and so forth. Plus each library has its own sort of hidden preferences, like certain activations that each one prefers for certain applications, believe it or not. Also, these are the Keras 1.x names and Keras 2 just came out a couple months ago with all new names. All right, so for graphs, I did GraphX for Spark. Uh, for Python, there are a couple of libraries for graphs, uh, but I just chose to use a plain old adjacency matrix uh, because of course, uh, graphs are isomorphic to matrices. And then that's, that's an easy sentence to say, graphs are isomorphic to matrices, but there's a deeper phil philosophical under, underlayment there um, because you know there's a lot of mystique around graphs you know what, what can be used with uh, what can they be used for what can you put in them um, but once you realize that they're isomorphic to matrices then that puts it in the realm of comfort and understanding and they're not so mysterious anymore um, for stop words I just used NLTK for both actually I didn't import it in either case I just uh, read the file directly um, out of the distribution uh, I only used the stop words um, for the bigram detection. I did not use it for the CNN because, um, you know, the, the one-dimensional convolution that's being used in the CNN for sentiment analysis, uh, a windy convolution is basically like time-based, and I didn't want to interrupt the cadence by st uh, stripping out the stop words. All right, so the results. Um, so I used the same sentiment data that a lot of uh, people use, which is the IMDB review data, movie review data coming out of Cornell. So uh, on IMDB, users can rate, give a star rating, one to four stars, uh, along with a short text uh, description. So that those stars are thresholded by Cornell into positive and negative, and it's a, it's a nice data set to use. Uh, for data prep, I just stripped out the punctuation and split the words. I did not bother to same case it, like make everything uppercase because the Google News model is trained with uh, both upper and lowercase variants. All right, so the, the results uh, in both the Keras case and the Deep Learning 4J case, uh, adding the co-occurrence graph by gram features uh, increased the accuracy. Uh, DL4J was not as accurate as Keras, and that's even after a lot of manual tweaking. Uh, probably with even more tweaking, I could have gotten it to be equal. Um, but also, uh, you know, the DL4J does come with a sentiment analysis as example, and it doesn't use CNNs, it uses LSTM. So, you know, LSTMs may be better for DL4J. I, I didn't actually try that. Um, now, 
I, I think there's a lot of lessons that uh, can be conveyed by what didn't work, and I'm, it's actually a little embarrassing that I even thought some of these things might work, but despite my embarrassment, I'm gonna tell you what didn't work. Um, so when I first read about this uh, CNN word of vec technique a couple of years ago, um, the first thought that occurred to me is, why are they just using a one-dimensional CNN? Why not, why not exploit both dimensions of this, of this matrix? And, and you, could, you could add coherence into this matrix by reordering the columns, by, making, uh, by putting similar columns next to each other. Uh, and, and then you could figure out which columns in this word defect model are similar to each other using a minimum spanning tree. So my idea was to take the 3 million by 300 matrix uh, from the Google News word defect model, and take those 300 columns, each of 3 million components, lay them out on a graph, uh, and connect them together uh, using a minimum spanning tree, uh, such as the algorithm from my book, and then do a depth first walk on this minimum spanning tree and reorder the columns according to that order. Now, that didn't work. Uh, it didn't improve anything, I should say, uh, because the one-dimensional convolutional neural network is actually already taking advantage of all 300 dimensions simultaneously. So one point in the Wendy CNN is actually a 300 component vector. And, and so it's doing a gradient descent on 300 dimensions simultaneously, and there's nothing to be gained by reordering the columns. So another thought I had was to identify some really negative words and some really positive words, and then to uh, spread that sentiment to its neighboring words. So uh, lay out all these points from the word defect vocabulary uh, and uh, do the semi-supervised learning algorithm uh, from my book. And uh, that didn't help any either because uh, it's just using the information from word defect. It, it, th this technique provided no new information to the machine learning system than just basically all the word defect vectors. And then the last thing I tried before I finally came up upon the co-occurrence graph for bigrams is to use a co-occurrence graph to identify unigrams, just single words at a time, but that provided no information beyond just bag of words or word defect. And for summary, so uh, I'm still trying to get the source code posted onto oracle.com. It's gonna take another two to four weeks. So you can monitor my personal blog, technicaltidbit.com, uh, for an announcement. Um, so uh, we kind of went through a symbolic winter and a neurosymbolic winter, um, but there's a lot to be gained by combining symbolic techniques, classic AI, with uh, neural networks. Um, and those, that combination is better than neural-only techniques. I recommend Keras and Jupyter as a great prototyping tool. You can rapidly try out new ideas and see if they work, and uh, you can benefit from the hand-holding that Keras gives you. Uh, and then for, uh, uh, for deep learning on Spark, uh, DL4J is an option. Uh, it's free. It also supports uh, GPU on Spark. It also <laughs> it gives you a way out to be able to actually read in the Google News model under Spark. Uh, and that is it. Thank you. Awesome. So if anyone has questions, feel free to come up to one of the two standing microphones uh, in the auditorium. Hi, yeah, that was super interesting. Um, I just had a kind of question slash comment. Um, a couple of months ago, a group from OpenAI released actually an unsupervised sentiment uh, model. So it was based on a uh, recurrent neural network using LSTM, which I think you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, so they're actually using Amazon product reviews, and their model was actually just to predict the next character in the sequence. <laughs> but then they found out that like, you know, the embedding before the prediction uh, one of the numbers in that pr uh, embedding was actually like perfectly correlated with sentiment. They claim um, they matched or beat all existing benchmarks. Like, have you heard of it or? No, I haven't heard of it. That's very interesting, actually. Yeah. Cool. I, I can't comment on it. <laughs> Check it out. All right, well, if there are no more questions, let's give uh, Michael another round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>